Welcome back to the Economic Analyst Channel. In this video, I'm going to go over the recent money supply numbers that have just been published and the implications from this data and, and why I think this is happening. So in a shocking twist, money supply numbers have largely flatlined in 2022. There was a little bit of growth and a run up all the way up to April. And then there was a drop off in late April and May. And as a matter of fact, if you take the last week ending M2 figures, it's actually lower than where the money supply was at the beginning of 2022 and the end of 2021. So what's causing this money supply to actually be flat and actually slightly slope downwards? It's some type of statistical anomaly. At first, I thought so because in the beginning of January, we did see a drop off in the money supply numbers and then they, the numbers built back up and then it dropped off again. And I'm sure we're going to see some ebb and flow to these money supply figures. But you have to understand this is very unorthodox to see numbers like these flatline or drop for any extended period of time with record low interest rates and recent monetary stimulus. Now, it is true that the Fed is beginning to slightly raise the federal funds rate. And it's also true that the Federal Reserve has halted its asset purchases. But we've had this in times past where the Federal Reserve would hike their interest rates and it would not cause the money supply figures to um, absolutely just drop to nothing, okay? So it, while the annual rates are dropping, they're dropping very, very fast. And so the recent year-over-year -year money supply figures point to a drop of 7%. And just for a frame of reference, 7%, one year ago, when we go back and take a look at uh, the money supply numbers one year ago, it was at between 15 and 16% uh, annual monetary inflation. So that's a huge drop that's what you know that's been going on so far so um first off let's go over some of the implications of this will this affect prices yes eventually okay and the reason why i say that is because when we take a look at monetary inflation annualized compared to the cpi we see different variances between the performance of the CPI and its and its inflation rate and money inflation. Nevertheless, the minimum, the minimum I've ever seen, and this was back in 2011, between the peak of monetary inflation and the peak of the CPI was about 40%. So in other words, the CPI increased about 40% of monetary inflation. You got to remember there's there's effects that go on about this. There's different levels of growth. And as I've pointed out before, the CPI is a composition of wage expenses and commodities. So if commodity prices are not fluctuating like the money supply figures are, and they could be due to certain global issues that have been going on, perhaps other global countries are not demanding commodities at the rate that the U.S. is for a time, it can be that we can. it looks like we can have our cake and eat it too. It could also be that the monetary inflation didn't go to pay out wages. It may have gone to, it may have gone to invest in stock indices and, and push up stock valuations. There's a whole host of excuses that we can come up with to explain why the CPI doesn't rise in tandem with the, C, with the uh, money supply, at least recently. But nevertheless, the recent, the, the, the lowest trend I've ever seen has been a 40% performance of the CPI versus monetary peak inflation. Well, money supply inflation peaked at 27% in February of 2021. So then it stands to reason that the CPI at minimum will peak at about say 11% annualized inflation before finally coming down. And there's no guarantee that it will peak there. Perhaps it will continue to build on. We don't know. But I don't think that the CPI has peaked just yet. And the uh, you know statistics that I have aggregated between the money supply, between the CPI, between you know factoring in real GDP growth and everything, I've created this price formulation index and did what I could to control 
for those factors, but even when we control for the last 10-year trend of the CPI and the money supply factoring in GD, real GDP growth and everything, we're still looking at this huge run-up in the price formulation index that I've composed. So this jump in money has not, the CPI has not caught up with that. Now, it, it's unknown whether there'll be some new equilibrium established between the relationship between money and prices as we move forward. Maybe what will happen is we'll have elevated inflation rates for some time while the money supply numbers drop and then we'll catch up in the long run years to come. Or we could see the run up now. I cannot really say which one that's going to manifest. If I were to guess, I would say as long as the U.S. economy remains stable, we'll probably see a longer, longer term catch up. But that does not mean that we have seen peak inflation here. So it is a good thing that the money supply numbers have peaked, at least on a, on a price level front. However, it takes time for that to manifest in the CPI. So for a frame of reference, when the Federal Reserve first began juicing money back in the middle of 2020, it took over a year before we started seeing that manifest in rising price inflation. And even then, it didn't, it didn't result in the peak. So what's going on with these dropping money supply figures? That's good for lowering prices, but the drop is probably not going to manifest till, say, at the minimum, at minimum, summer of this year. Okay, So in the next couple of months, it is possible, potentially, because of this severe drop in the money supply, and it really started around 2021 of last year, it is possible that we might see that peak in price inflation and then a calming down you know, as we go into the later ends of 2022. But I would say that is the earliest that we will see this. So how is the Fed accomplishing this? Okay, We've been hearing reports about how consumer lending has been booming and total debt is still increasing. So how is the Fed putting the backstop on the money supply? Or is this some type of statistical anomaly? At first, I did think it was a statistical anomaly. But now I'm not so sure. And I'll go over my reasons on why, I, how I think the Fed is actually doing this and um, you know, go over some of the reasons why I think the Fed is doing this besides just a tamp down on the money supply. But uh, you know, is this going to be effective going forward? So let's take a look at the traditional measures that the Fed has used to control price inflation, okay? They control it by raising the federal funds rate, which sucks out liquidity in the short end of the of the government bond spectrum, okay? So they're they're raising they're raising the amount the cost of loans that banks that uh, banks can charge to each other and they're doing this by selling off treasury assets traditionally speaking and taking that for cash and then taking those bank cash balances and depositing them back at the Fed, which effectively destroys money. Now, this is being offset by banks creating new money through generating new loans. But generally speaking, when banks are faced with cash squeezes, they will cut back on lending because they don't have as much money to loan, which makes interest rates more expensive, which is how we don't get more money entering the system that controls prices. Well, all right, that's wonderful. What's the Fed doing now with the federal funds rate? Oh boy, they have hiked interest rates by a whole three quarters of a percent. Is that really what's causing the money supply to flatline? I don't think so. This is what I think that they're doing. And it's that they are selling overnight repurchase agreements. And they've been doing this since 2021. And it has been constantly building. But notice that in 20, at the end of 2021, overnight repurchase agreements, treasuries sold by the Fed in temporary open market operations. So they're selling them to the banks, repurchasing the next day. It was at $1.6 trillion at the end of 2021. It has since built to $2 trillion in May of 2022. Now, it is true that they're repurchasing them the very next day. But if you think about it, if they're selling them and reselling them to the banks day after day after day after day, then in reality, they're sucking out liquidity on a temporary basis, but they're still permanently taking it out of the banks because they're recycling it back in the next day, then they swap it out, and then they do it back and forth, and it's this ebb and flow. 
but they have raised the amount that they're sucking out of the banks on that back end by a whopping $400 billion. This has had the result of since the end of 2021 of dropping reserve balances. So reserve uh, total reserves at held uh, by banks at the Federal Reserve has dropped by $4.2 trillion at the end of December 2021 to $3.6 trillion at the end of April. And that kind of makes sense because that goes right in line with the buildup of these overnight repurchase agreements here. So in essence, even though the Fed is just drain draining reserve balances, by selling this, it's still putting a potential pressure squeeze on potential liquidity of banks. And banks, I think, are becoming more hesitant to create loans or at least so on and so forth. And when we get those loan figures next month of total debt, we'll probably see a little bit of a slowdown. But I think the combination of the two is actually having that draining effect on the money supply. So the Fed, in essence, has already started its quantitative tightening, but it's doing it through the reverse repurchase agreements. Now, why is the Fed doing this through the reverse repurchase agreements? Why not just start up quantitative tightening and sell back to the banks permanently? Well, I think it's to, uh, uh, it's to avoid what happened in September of 2019 when the Fed sold too much for the banks to handle and it drained liquidity and it caused a repo crisis. It caused repo interest rates and short-term interest rates, and, and eventually it would have caused the federal funds rate to spike. And so what I think the Fed is doing is that by selling it to the banks on a temporary basis, they are testing how much the banks can can withstand uh, potential real quantitative tightening. So by the Fed's measurements, the banks can hold at least $2 trillion of the assets that the Fed has. And Fed assets have totaled of around near $9 trillion. So if the banks can hold... Nine, uh, two trillion of Fed assets, the Fed realizes that it can sell those permanently to the banks and it won't really drain or, or cause a liquidity drain on the process of normal banking operations while still having the effect of dropping or at least tamping down money supply growth. It might actually cause a real drop in the money supply and normally this would have a more profound effect on prices, yet due to the gap between the money growth that we saw in 2020 and 2021 and the rise in the CPI, I don't think that we've seen all that money flushed out into the economy yet, so we're probably still going to see some elevated inflation, but longer term, this will definitely bring down that inflation rate. So it is it is possible that we could see inflation tamp down in the coming months, although, you know, Gauging this and forecasting this, this is really more of an art than it is a science. It's more of guesstimating. But right now, this is what the Fed is doing, and it's having this effect on money. How's this going to affect asset classes? Well, originally, with the stock market, the rise in interest rates will push down stocks over time. Okay, So we've already seen a stock market correction. The stock correction will continue. If the Fed pushes too much on interest rates and debt... It is true it can cause a credit crisis. It can burst a credit bubble. However, based off of my estimates, we as long as the Fed keeps the federal funds rate below 5%, we should be okay there. And then lastly comes to precious metals. Um, and I'll go over a little bit more of a detailed analysis. But initially speaking, the more the Fed drains out of money, the more depressed precious metals prices will come. Now, right now, Precious metals on gold is is about is valued probably about accurate with its with its market price is a little bit low market price is a little bit low compared to its mark uh, its value silver is still depressed by about ten percent right now and that'll probably be my next video is to go over another gold silver outlook on this there are there like I said before when you pay attention to my gold value model um, there are other factors that play into gold and silver. So uh, there's still a chance and a potential for, for us to have the bump in gold and silver, but, but this extra drain out of the money supply is definitely going to hamper that as well. Still, I think precious metals are going to be the play because compared to stocks and bonds, that's really going to be the only asset class that performs right quick. In the long run, 
We're even going to see commodities get depressed from this. I know that's hard to believe with the run-up in oil prices and food prices. And yeah, geopolitical situations can keep those elevated for some time. But if we start seeing this drain on this money supply, or at least this drop, this huge steep drop in money supply growth, in the coming months, probably within, I would say probably by the end of the year, we should see price inflation peak from this. Guys, that's all I have for this video. I hope you guys have a happy Memorial Day. Uh, stay tuned to my channel for future vids on this, given the uh, updates on the economic analysis. If you like the content that I provide, show me some support, like that channel, subscribe to the channel if you haven't already, drop me a comment, let me know what you think about all of this, let me, let me know your insights into this as I seek to learn from you, as you seek to learn from me, and as always, I'll talk to you next time.